I, Urban, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, to all the faithful, both princes and subjects, waiting in Flanders, greeting apostolic grace and blessing. Your brotherhood, we believe, has long since learned from many accounts that a barbaric fury has de deployed, afflicted, and laid waste the churches of God in the regions of the Orient. More than this, blasphemous to say, it has graced in terrible servitude its churches and the holy city of Christ, glorified by his passion and resurrection. Grieving with pious concern at this calamity, we visited the regions of Gaul and devoted ourselves largely to urging the princes of the land and their subjects to free the churches of the East. We solemnly enjoyed upon them at a council of Avignon the accomplishment of such an undertaking as a preparation for the remission of all their sins. And we have constituted our most beloved son, Admir, Bishop of Pew, leader of this expedition and undertaking in our stead, so that those who perchance may wish to undertake this journey should comply with his commands, as they were our own, and submit fully to his loosings and bindings, as far as shall seem to belong to such an office. If, moreover, there are any of your people whom God has inspired to this vow, let them know that he will set out with the aid of God on the day of assumption of the blessed Mary, and that they can attach themselves to his following. Deus Volt, God wills it! Deus Volt, God wills it! Deus Volt, God wills it! Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Scotland, episode 28, The People's Crusade. That exempt you heard at the start of this episode was the letter of instruction to the Crusaders dated December 1095 AD by Urban II after the Council of Clement in 1095. I want to apologise for any headphone users that I may have broken the eardrums of with the Deus Vault at the end. But Deus Vault, God wills it, was the cries that were heard at the end of the speech that Urban gave, a saying that became synonymous with the Crusades. But before we begin on that today, let me first say I am happy to announce I have uploaded the re-recording of the very first episode in this podcast series. I'm planning to release the second re-recorded episode within the next month or so, so please head to our Twitter or Facebook group if you wish to know when it's been released. I would recommend any longtime fan give both the earlier episode that I've re-recorded ago and the new second episode when I've done it, as the earlier re-recorded episodes are better in both quality and writing and the audio is ten times better. I'll keep you all updated as I go through and redo these earlier episodes. Anyway, last time we began with the King Edgar of Scotland. Edgar was the fourth son of Malcolm III and Margaret of Wessex. He was born in roughly 1074, meaning he was about 33 when he came to the throne in 1097. Edgar may have not been a famous Scottish king, but as I said last time, he was a very stable ruler who during his reign prevented the realm from sinking into anarchy, just like what happened a few years ago. Edgar had no children though, and instead named his older brother Alexander as heir. Edgar died in Edinburgh on the 8th of January 1107 and was buried at Dunfelm Abbey. Alexander was his acknowledged successor, as I said, and he came to the throne without civil war. This may be due to Edgar's will also granting his younger brother David, who was younger than Alexander and would be later known as our famous David I, and a panage in Cumbria, which meant the lands of the former kingdom of Strathclyde he could rule, and perhaps also in southern parts of Lafan. Now... Rather than move our story swiftly to Alexander I, I think you already know what's coming, I have decided I want to tell the tale of the First Crusade, as it's a giant moment in medieval history, and a tale I really would like to tell. So please indulge me whilst I begin this tale, and I promise we will return back to our story after this three-part special. Now, in today's episode, we begin the first part of this story. It is called The People's Crusade. The rather less known story of the First Crusade, a story's conclusion that nearly derailed the entire First Crusade before it ever began. So, let us begin with a return back to the Council of Clermont in 1095. 
Duke William of Aquitaine founded the Monastery of Cluny in the early 10th century to make his mind feel, feel better over a guilty conscience for a violent sin in his youth. He could not have known that his gift would result in one of the most famous speeches in history. Cluny contributed to a church reform movement in the 11th century by producing several monks who elected to the papacy. One such monk was Odo, who became Pope on the March the 12th, 1088 AD, taking the name we all know him as today, Urban II. Like the earlier reforming Pope, Saint Leo, Urban decided to exercise papal authority and power at the service of the reform movement by travelling throughout Christendom. His visit to France was the first by a pope in a generation and was intended to open the great abbey church at Cluny. The pope took advantage of this road trip to implement the reform movement by meeting with bishops and attending local councils. Urban's 14-month trip through France saw him visit the regions of Provence, Louvendoc, the Rhone Valley, Burgundy, Anjou, and the cities of Avignon, Lens, Le Mans, Tours, Poitiers, Bordeaux, Corsican, Toulouse, Montpellier, and Arles. He arrived at Clermont, which is southwest of Cluny, in late November 1095, to attend a local council. The agenda at Clermont centred on the issues of reform. Discipline canons providing penalties for violations of church laws regarding celibacy and investiture. Now, this took place on November 27th, when Urban spoke to a large assembly in the open air. This speech inaugurated the Crusaders movement and is one of the most significant papal speeches in the 2000 year history of the church. Despite the significance of the event, there are no direct records of what Urban actually said, but there are five accounts of the speech all written after the event by authors Fulicher of Chards, Robert the Monk, Baldu of Dalk, Goubert of Nogent and William of Malmesbury, who were either present at the meeting or just compiled their version of their speech from those who were present. These accounts illustrate three themes in Urban's speech. The need for liberation of the holy city of Jerusalem, the violent activities of the Turks, and the exhortation to the Christian warriors to take up arms. Now, Urban focused his speech on the cross and urged the warriors of France to embrace an armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The liberation of Jerusalem was paramount for Urban, and he knew this clause would resonate with the French nobility and knights that were attending. Now, the French had a great devotion to the holy city, and pilgrimages were extremely popular in this area. Jerusalem was considered the centre of the world, and its occupation by the Muslims was a disaster to the citizens of Christendom. Urban highlighted the importance of Jerusalem in the life of Christ, saying, this city, the redeemer of the human race, has made illustrations by his advent and his beautiful residence, has consecrated by suffering, has redeemed by death, has glorified by burial. He pleaded with the French warriors to forego their selfish desires and goals and come to the aid of Jerusalem. This royal city is now held captive by his enemies, he said, and is sub to those who do not know God. She seeks therefore and desires to be liberated and does not cease to implore you to come to her aid. Urban's preaching focused also on the plight of Christians in the Holy Land who were subjected to cruel tortures and punishments at the hands of the Turks. His graphic description of Turkish atrocities were designed to elect a visceral response from his hearsayers so they would volunteer to liberate their Christian brothers and sisters. Urban reported the various ways the Turks tortured and killed these Christians, and the Christian brothers and sisters, as I said, would want to volunteer to save these people. After mentioning the violation of women, the Pope exhorted the assembled warriors at Clement to rush to the defence of their persecuted brethren, saying, On whom, therefore, is the labour of avenging these wrongs, and of recovering this territory incumbent, if that upon you? Many would respond to the need to liberate Jerusalem due to the immense devotion in France for the holy city, and some would rage at the injustices upon fellow Christians in the East. Still, Urban feared that many warriors would hesitate to sign up for this task. Due to this noble background, Urban was intently familiar with the mentality of warriors and knew how to motivate the knights. In his speech at Clermont, Urban appealed to the military adventures of the great warriors in French history in order to exert his listeners to join the crusade. 
Let the deeds of your ancestors move you and incite your minds to manly adventures. O oh, manly, valiant soldiers and descendants of invincible ancestors, be not degenerate, but recall the valour of your pregenitors. Finally, Urban offered a spiritual incentive for warriors to participate in the crusade, an indulgence. Though the power and authority of the office, Urban decreed that whoever goes on the journey to free the Church of God in Jerusalem out of devotion alone and not for gaining of glory or money can substitute the journey for all penance for sin. This actually meant even if you committed crime or sins, you could sign up for the crusade and you could be rid of your sin and be welcomed into the temple of God. Pope Urban II's speech at Clermont was one of the most important in Western history. It launched the First Crusade, but more importantly, which is what today's episode is based on, it launched the People's Crusade. Peter the Hermit, also known as Peter of Amens because he was born in that French town, had never been within miles of any Pope, but that did not prevent him from telling his followers that he was the one who persuaded Urban to preach for this crusade. Peter was certainly among the first to preach it, but it is known that were many others who were advocating the same thing. It was nonetheless Peter who became the de facto leader for many of the crusaders. A former soldier, Peter was short, an elderly man whose face was almost as long and sad as that of a donkey he always rode. His garments were always filthy. His bare feet had not been washed in years. He ate no meat or fruit, living almost entirely on wine and fish. In 1093, Peter had made a pilgrimage to Palestine, but he was unable to reach the holy city. One contemporary who knew him, Abbot Gilbert of Nogant, stated that he seemed somehow semi-divine, both in his actions and his words. Within a short time, he had 15,000 followers. His higher-ranking followers, the most notable, capable French knight, Walter Savignon, or Walter the Penniless, brought thousands of men-at-arms with them. German leaders such as Goschank and Orel formed similar armies, but probably on a smaller scale. Both Emperor Alexius of the Eastern Roman Empire, or otherwise known as the Byzantine Empire as we know it today, and Pope Urban II wanted armies, not a rebel to assist them with taking on the holy city and its surrounding land. The mob that rallied to the Pope's appeal caused Emperor Alexius grave concern, because their leaders could not control them. Alexius heard, according to the writings of his chronicled daughter, that all the West, even the barbarians who dwell beyond the Adriatic, out as far as Gibraltar, are on the move, bringing their whole families with them. In the spring of 1096, Peter halted at Cologne. Although he had always given his every coin to the poor, he now realised that he could not lead his followers on such a journey without a war chest. Walter, impatiently with many delays, had already set out from France. He sent messages ahead to request permission from King Coloman of Hungary to allow him passage through his lands. Permission was granted and the passage was completed with little incident. Emperor Alexios had established stores along the route of the approaching Westerners, but they could not begin to feed the hordes of approaching his borders. He now learned that a second, much larger throng was also on its way. With a small military escort of lesser German nobility leading his rebel, Peter finally began his eastward trek, following in Walter's footsteps. Things went well until they reached now Zerman, a small Hungarian frontier town, where 16 of Walter's men had run afoul of the law, being stripped of their arms and sent on their way. Their weapons were still hanging on the town walls for all to see, and the sight sent wild rumours flying through the Crusaders' ranks. Hostility towards the Hungarians grew until an argument over the sale of a pair of shoes sparked a riot, and the Crusaders attacked the townsfolk. Shops and markets were looted, and hundreds of Hungarians were killed. Then, the frightened King Coloman, King of Hungary's reaction, the Crusaders tried to cross the river into Byzantine territory to avoid the King's anger. When Walter's mob had crossed the river earlier, the military commander of Belgrade had been taken by surprise. He had received no instructions on how to handle such an invasion, so he sent messengers racing to the provincial governor in Nish, also asking for advice. This governor, a conscientious but lacklustre leader, requested guidance from Constantinople. At Belgrade, Walter demanded food for his followers, but the available supply was far too small to feed such a multitude of warriors. 
Walter and his troops began to pillage the countryside, forcing the local commander to call out his troops. Several crusaders were killed. Walter finally made it into Nish, where the crusading army was given an escort to Constantinople. By the time Peter reached the Hungarian border, his ranks had swelled to close to 20,000. Stealing lumber from houses, his men built rafts to cross the river. The local troops, mostly mercenaries, were sent into barges to keep the crossing orderly, while local inhabitants retired to the mountains. Peter's mob resisted every attempt to keep it under control, and had forced its way across the Savia by June the 26th. When the escorting guards tried to keep the crusaders along one specified route, Peter's men attacked again. Many of these guards were captured and put to death, while Belgrade was looted and torched. After a seven-day march, Peter arrived at Nish on the July the 3rd. His very first act was to demand food. When Peter was asked to supply hostages as a guarantee over good conduct, Geoffrey Burrell and Walter of Bertou were handed over. This was Christian territory, and several local people joined the Crusaders. The next morning, the Crusaders set out from Sofia, but as they were leaving for Nish, a group of Germans who had quarrelled with some of the townspeople the night before set fire to a cluster of mills. When the governor heard of the incident, he sent troops to attack the rear guard and take hostages. A man named Labert ran to Peter with the news, and Peter turned back to talk with the governor and to ransom the captives. During the conference, wild rumours once again spread among the crusaders. A large company of them attacked the town, but was driven off. When a still larger group resumed the assault, the governor unleashed his army. The crusaders were completely routed. Many were killed, while others were captured and spent their remaining years as slaves. Peter lost his chest of money. He and the other leaders and over some 500 spent the night huddled in the mountains, believing that they were the only survivors. In reality, about one-fourth of their company had been lost. On July the 12th, the remaining crusaders reached Sofia, and from there they proceeded under imperial escort to Constantinople, arriving on August the 1st. Meanwhile, another wave of crusaders was on the march, venting much of their religious-inspired wrath against the Muslims on another group of infidels who were less able to defend themselves. This was the European Jewry. Earlier, Peter and his rabble had extorted money from the Jews, whom they declared murderers of Christ, to finance their journey. But his later followers unleashed the pogrom in earnest. Urban raised no hand to stop the persecution, and even though he was in the area where the worst excesses took place, German contingents who followed Peter, especially the one that led by a Swabian count, Emek von Linnick, became notorious for their cruelty. Emek first attacked the Jews of Speer, 12 of whom were saved through the intervention of a local bishop. The Bishop of Worms tried to protect these Jews, but the Crusaders stormed into his palace and slaughtered 500 people who had taken shelter there and killed another 300 over the next two days. At Mons, Emic laid siege to the city and demanded ransom from the Jews to spare their lives. Their ransom was paid, but Emic stormed the city anyway. The Jews sought refuge in the palace of the Archbishop, a relative of Emic, but he was driven from the city. With their situation hopeless, the Jews chose quick death to more agonising doom they could expect at the hand of the Christians. Since suicide was prohibited under Jewish law, they first killed their elderly brethren and then each other. About 1,000 Jews died in Mans, but its chief rabbi and some 50 survivors sought asylum in Rutersel, where the archbishop had retreated to his country villa. The archbishop agreed under condition that the Jews convert to Christianity, at which point the rabbi, crazed with rage, seized a knife and attacked him. In consequence, the last of the man's Jews were also slain. Finally, the Jews in the Rhineland were all murdered or bled dry, and large groups of Germans started out on the road previously travelled by Walter and Peter. While the Crusaders had previously limited their thefts to Jewish pottery, they now stole from fellow Christians along the way. Another German band, led by a nobleman named Volkmoor, reached Prague at the end of May and fell upon its Jewish community. When these crusaders tried to do the same thing in the Hungarian town of Netra, however, they were themselves killed or taken prisoner by the Hungarian army. The king of Hungary, the only king in Europe who afforded his Jewish subjects any protection, had already experienced the unruly behaviour of the early waves of crusaders, 
and was less willing to tolerate his new contingent. That summer, Emek's army laid siege to the Hungarian fortress town for six weeks until rumours that King Coloman was coming with a release force. Disheartened, the Germans at which point the garrison sallied out forth and scattered the crusaders. In sum, as many as 10,000 crusaders were killed by the Hungarians. The few survivors turned back or established new homes along the path of the march, none having reached Constantinople. Constantinople must have been an incredible sight to the Europeans who did reach it. Like all the major cities of the Middle East, it had lavish buildings and public art. Central water supplies served the rich at least, and street lights were common. Emperor Alexius was anxious to meet Peter and received him at court. Lean, ugly, and burned brown by the sun, still dressed only in his ragged and filthy cloak, Peter must have seemed an odd figure indeed amid the silks and splendour of the Byzantine courtiers. As for Peter, one can but wonder what he might have thought of the city, at which a chronicler wrote on what an excellent and beautiful city, how many monasteries, how many places are in it, of wonderful work skilfully fashioned, how many marvellous works are to be seen in the streets and districts of the town. It is a great nuisance to recite what an opulence of all kings of goods are found there, of gold, of silver, of many kinds of mantles and holy relics. In every season, merchants in frequent sailings bring to that place everything that a man might need. But, again, Peter's people stole everything they could from the homes and palaces, even and led from the churches. Within days, Emperor Alexius had his navy ferry the crusaders across the Bosporus Strait to Anatolia. There, they were ushered into an old army encampment where the women, children and sick individuals could live during the campaign to come. The crusaders, too, were instructed to stand fast until more seasoned knights and men-at-arms arrived and an effective campaign could be launched. But they did not wait. At the first crusade's raid into the Turkish territory was short-lived and timid. They robbed and pillaged nearby villages, not caring that the villages were fellow Christians, who, contrary to the exaggerated reports heard in Europe, were tolerated within the Islamic world as fellow people of the book, although they had an inferior social status and were more heavily taxed in accordance with Islamic tenets of the Quran, tribute or the sword. In September, thousands of Frenchmen marched inland to the provincial capital of Nicaea. They passed through several Christian villages and commanded the newly gathered harvest, mercenary massacring any peasants who tried to resist. At that time, the Sultan or King of the region found out and was massively displeased with this event. The Sultan dispatched a cavalry patrol, but the Turks were hopelessly outnumbered, and the Franks, which soon evolved into the general Turkish and Arabic term for any foreigners, cut them to pieces. Only a few survivors managed to link back into Nicaea. The Frenchmen had no chance of breaching the 16,000 metre long walls with their 240 turrets, but they did not have some success in raiding the suburbs. Again, they killed several Christians who fell into their hands. The Sultan believed that he had lost prestige and wanted immediate revenge, but his advisers convinced him to wait. He did not have to wait very long, for the newly arriving German and Italian crusaders were not to be outdone. In September 1096, two weeks after the attack on Nicaea, some 6,000 of them set out in the same direction taken by the French. They looted as a march, but unlike the French, they spared the Christians. The Frangi circled around the city and marched off towards the east, however, taking the Ungaristan fortress of Zenagordum by surprise. They planned to use that castle as a base for raids into the countryside, but within days they were surrounded by Turks. This fortress had no internal water supply. The stream that supplied the area flowed through a valley outside the castle walls. According to a chronicler of the day, the crusaders were so tormented by thirst that they drew blood from the veins of their horses and asses and drank it. Some pissed into hands of others who drank it. Many dug into the moist ground and laid down, spreading the earth over them to allay their parching thirst. This lasted eight days. On September the 29th, the leader of the defenders sued for terms and amazed his besiegers by offering to fight with them against other crusaders. The Turks promised only to spare the lives of those who renounced Christianity. The leader and a few others did so and were sold into slavery. The rest were put to the sword. According to Arab historians, the Sultan sent two spies to Sibiot to spread glowing tales of the French success at the fortress to ensure that the Europeans remained calm. 
That worked until a man arrived who had somehow escaped the fortress and told of the slaughter of the European force. Peter the Hermit was visiting Constantinople when he learned of it, and the other leaders held an emergency meeting. Wise Consul held them in place for a few days. Then word came of the Turks advancing on the camp. Siviot would have been best for the place for the Crusaders to meet the Turks, but the leader of the many hotheads opposed such defensive tactics. Cries of cowardice outweighed reason, and the men who opposed such defensive tactics marched out to meet the enemy on October the 21st. Three miles from where they came from, the road passes through a valley, and there the Turks waited, inside hidden into small woods. With the knights at the head of their column, the crusaders moved forward in a laughing, joking mob. According to Arab history, many of the knights were not even wearing their armour. Suddenly, volleys of arrows cut them down by the thousands. Horses stampeded back through the infantry. Then the showers of arrows were replaced by the rank after charging rank of disciplined, deadly Turkish horsemen. Few remaining armoured knights that were left did fight with the bravery they were accustomed to, but they were helpless against the masses of light cavalry from the east. In the camp at Savot, women cooked and priests celebrated morning mass. A vast cloud of dust was seen rising in the distance. Then the surviving crusaders stumbled into camp heading headlong into a flight. They could not outrun the Turkish horses. Somehow in the midst of the battle, the Turks took a liking to a tiny handful of children and spared their lives. A few others were taken prisoner to be sold into slavery, while about 3,000 people took refuge in an old castle by the seaside. Survivors withstood the Turks until the siege was lifted by the Greek navy. But, left in Constantinople with a small number of surviving followers during the winter of 1096 to 1097, with little hope of securing Byzantine support, the People's Crusade waited the armed crusaders as their sole source of protection to complete their pilgrimage. When the princes of the First Crusade arrived, Peter joined their ranks as a member of the council in May 1097, and with the little following which remained, they marched together through Asia Minor to Jerusalem. While his paupers never regained the numbers previous to the Battle of Seville, his ranks were increasingly replenished with disarmed, injured or bankrupted crusaders. Nevertheless, aside from a few rousing speeches to motivate the crusaders, he played a junior part in the remaining history of the First Crusade, which at this point clearly settled on a military campaign as a means to secure the pilgrimage routes and holy sites in Palestine. Peter appears at the beginning of 1098 as attempting to escape from the previations of the Siege of Antioch, showed himself a fallen star, and other sources go on to write that Peter was responsible for the speech before the half-starved and dead crusaders, which motivated their sally from the gates of Antioch and got them the victory over the overwhelmingly superior Muslim army besieging the city. Thus, having recovered his stature, in the middle of the year he was sent by the princes to invite Kerbenok to settle all differences via a duel, which the emir subsequently declined. In 1099, Peter appears as a treasurer of the alms at the Siege of Ark, and as leader of the processions around the walls of Jerusalem before it fell, and later within Jerusalem which preceded the Crusaders' surprising victory at the Battle of Asculon. At the end of 1099, Peter sailed back to the west. From this time, he disappears from our historical record. Albert of Ack records that he died in 1131 as a prior of a church of the Holy Sculpture which he founded in France. This is very little concrete record for Peter's life after returning to Europe, and much of what is known is speculation or legend. It is generally quoted that he founded a monastery in France. Peter's obituary reads, the death of Don Pierre, of pious memory, venerable priest and hermit, who deserves to be appointed by Lord to announce the first to the Holy Cross. And then the text continues with, After the conquest of the Holy Land, Pierre returned to his native country, and also that he founded this church and chooses them a decent burial. Ill-conceived crusade of the people's crusade, or the poor people, had come to a disastrous end. But in a curious way, it had laid the groundwork for the greater success by the better organised armies that followed it. When the Sultan of Rum saw how easily his army had annihilated the invaders at the cost of only minor casualties, he began to feel that there were nothing to fear from the Europeans. 
Early in 1097, the Sultan of Rum was informed that an even larger Frankish army had arrived, but he dismissed the threat. Of much more importance was the fact that his rival, King Dashamed the Wise, had laid siege to Malta. When a second messenger brought updated news of the Europeans' progress in April, the Sultan sent a tiny detachment of cavalry to Nicaea simply to boost the citizens' morale. In early May, another messenger brought details of the new army, but by then it was too late. After the false start of this undisciplined first wave, the First Crusade had begun in earnest, and this time its march would not be stopped until it had reached its goal, Jerusalem, in July 1099. So, that's it for this week. Sorry for the long episode, but I won't lie, the next few parts of this special will likely just be as long, as I really want this tale to be told to its fullest extent, but also I don't want to split split it into six episodes. I hope you understand the crammed in information, I hope it's not too rushed, but I did try my best and I'm trying my best to fit it into these three episodes with the most of the historical information that I can. Now, next week we begin the actual First Crusade. The event that took the Levant and Jerusalem for the Christian nations and formed the many Christian kingdoms of the Middle East, mainly under the supervision of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. We will be going on an extraordinary adventure of conquest and bloodshed, as the Crusader army moves from the west to the east through the Eastern Roman Empire, looking to bring the Middle East to heel. Will it be a glorious tale of valour and piety, or will it just be another senseless war waged by powerful religious icons? We will find out next time for that, but I think after seeing what's happened in the People's Crusade, we can clearly see that this isn't a just, pious event, but a cruel campaign against the Arabs in the East. After next week's episode, we will finally do an episode on Scotland's participation in the First Crusade, and any Crusades going forward, standing what role the nation played in this European-wide theatre of war. The final reminder, this undertaking took place during the final years of Donald's reign and throughout Edgar's reign, just to give you an idea where it takes place during our story. But anyway, thank you again for everyone for the continued support on this series. If you have the time, please do follow our Twitter at the History of SC1, or search the History of Scotland on Twitter. We also have a Facebook group called the History of Scotland, if you wish to discuss the episodes with myself, with feedback and comments, so please head there. As always, any further corrections or issues with this podcast, please let me know at historyofscotlandpodcast at gmail.com. And please leave a review if you can. And our podcast is always available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and many other great podcasting sites. Podcast will be next week as normal. So until then, stay safe, have a great couple of weeks, guys, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Peace. Peace.